in your blog post as well, you mentioned voices in your head. What were, can you remember what they were kind of saying to you? I had no idea what to do when I woke up one day and it was like somebody had removed my ability to play the game. That ability left me for nearly as many years as I'd had it and the road back seemed like an impossible journey of misery and self-doubt. Even when things were going well, I used to get these little voices in my head telling me I didn't belong, convincing me I was some sort of imposter that would be exposed one day. I had always felt trapped in my own mind, thinking if I shared what was really happening in my brain, people would think I was weird. Hi, I'm Becky Brewerton, and this is my story. In my area, there weren't many girls that, that played golf. I was quite lucky. Um, my dad was an obsessive golfer, so I actually just used to go with him to, to spend a bit of time with him. They just started doing junior lessons at my club on a Saturday morning um, for 50p, and I was the only girl um, at the time. So I, I grew up playing with all the boys, which was, which was great. It was a good atmosphere. My dad had dropped me off seven o'clock in the morning in the summer holidays picked me up at seven o'clock at night so it was a it was a brilliant environment to be in to be honest for the first two or three years I played I didn't even realize that a female could become a professional um, I was just playing because I enjoyed it and um, as I got better I, I got better quite quickly so as I kind of got better and, and started to move through the ranks and played county and international golf um, it was sort of you know talked about and I realized you could do it as a career and as soon as that thought entered my head, it, it didn't really ever leave. Dame Laura Davis was um, my hero at the time. She was obviously a British player, a totally unique kind of player, real flair. Kari Webb as well was another one who was kind of dominating, major winner, probably one of the best swings in the whole world of golf. And Tiger Woods at, at the time um, as well was, was another one. That was when he was in his absolute dominant stage, just doing things that, that other people couldn't do in golf. I played in my first LET event as an amateur, I think when I was 16 at the Irish Open, um, which was before the, the two that I'd played in um, where I finished second. So I was, I was quite lucky to get to play in quite a few um, professional events as an amateur before turning pro to get the experience. It's slightly different when you're an amateur, obviously, and it's still not, not your career. I think you can go into those professional events and, and enjoy them a little bit more and use them as an experience, because I was looking at everyone else that I was playing with and just being wowed by how they could eat, still score well, even on days where you, know, you could tell they were frustrated because they weren't playing as well. I turned pro in 2004 and won my first event on the LET in 2007. I never got too far ahead of myself thinking, oh, you know, I'm destined to be a major winner or world number one or anything like that. I just enjoyed it on the course at the time and, and the rest of it I could 
possibly take or leave a little bit. My rookie, Becky Brewerton from Wales. In 2007, I managed to play well enough on the LET to qualify and play in my first ever Solheim Cup. Being the, the sort of first Welsh player, that obviously meant a, a huge amount to me. Um, and it was, it, it's the most surreal sort of week. It's hard to, to sort of take it all in because I think you're, you've got this sort of part of you that's so intent on really wanting to do well. And then there's another part of you that I think you just want to soak the whole thing up. We had like three kind of trailers that were put together as a team room and there was like table tennis and there was lo lots of other things going on. Very crisply through the ball, holding the follow through off. And that's nicely played. It was an absolute dream come true to play with Dame Laura Davis in that first Solheim Cup and, and really get to know her. It was the most surreal feeling because we, we ended up sort of becoming quite good friends and um, during the whole build up to the week um, we, we were obviously playing together in practice rounds quite a bit so there was the odd occasion where I remember thinking I still can't believe this is real because um, you're standing there with someone that you used to watch growing up um, in, in total awe of. Um, and she and like the character that she is as well makes you feel so at ease and, and it was just like having fun with one of your friends because she does nothing but, but take the mickey out of you basically the whole time and, and the whole week she was making jokes about how terrified I was going to be on the first tee and that I was hitting the first tee shot because she gets too nervous and just all, all that sort of stuff just in a way kind of made it easier because we were, we were kind of approaching it in a, in a jokey sort of way and, and then it made me feel, I think, a bit more at ease. It was like doing it with one of your friends. At the time, I think, because I was a bit unaware of, of what I was sort of, or how my thought process was, it, it was sort of easy to ignore, but I think the, the, there was wins where I possibly didn't enjoy it as much as, as I possibly should have, or maybe just thought, you know, even having the thought of how how did I manage to do that or you know I I didn't deserve that or even having those those kind of thoughts kind of taken away from it a little bit so I think there were little sort of niggly things that you could probably ignore to to a certain extent or at the time probably just think this this is normal this is what everyone m must be like and um, and just sort of carry on so I think yeah I even when I won I, obviously, I enjoyed it, but I don't think I pro probably gave myself internally the sort of level of appreciation, I guess, that I should have. I had a nasty fall at the uh, beginning of 2012. Uh, I was out on a, a bike ride um, out on practice in Spain before going to Australia and um, came down a hill a bit too fast, hit a stone on the road and managed to go over the handlebars and land into the kerb of the road straight into my hip joint, which uh, caused a few issues going forward. I had to tell myself I was okay, because if I wasn't playing golf, what was I? It was a race against time to be physically fit after I arrived, but the far more damaging aspect was my mental recovery. That took years. The fall felt like it was the start of it, um, but I think it was almost like it, it just triggered some sort of response, because I, I vividly remember the, the very next tournament after that had happened. So I only had a few weeks before I was supposed to travel to Australia to play in some events, and my whole le leg was black and it was quite painful, um, but it, it didn't. It didn't feel like a physical thing. It was. It was like I don't know whether it just knocked my confidence enough to kind of put me in a in a slightly different headspace. But it was that I remember saying to someone at the time, "It's like if you watch the Austin Powers films and it's someone says he's t taken away his mojo." It was like someone had removed this thing from my body that I needed to be able to sort of cope or or be able to push push all that stuff down and be able to perform. And it, and it was just, it was gone, basically. I think, honestly, it's, 
it's routine, it's just, there was, there was enough of a haze there at that point which had sort of started to come in is that I wasn't thinking about my own golf in a rational way. So if, if, I, if someone else had come up to me and said, look, this is what's happened to me, what should I do? I probably would have said, look, you need to take a break, you know, heal, heal physically, do some work mentally and then come back when you've kind of worked on it a bit. But I, I had zero ability to, to be objective about myself, basically. So it, it felt like even the easiest decisions to make just all of a sudden became really hard. Even when things were going well, I used to get these little voices in my head telling me I didn't belong, convincing me I was some sort of imposter that would be exposed one day. I had always felt trapped in my own mind, thinking if I shared what was really happening in my brain, people would think I was weird. When I had those sort of thoughts or voices in my head, it was it was always sort of telling me, you know, you're not good enough, you don't belong here. The little bit like maybe the sort of slight bit of that imposter syndrome where you feel like you're in this position and, and you shouldn't be. Um, and I, I used to get I mean I, I used to get a bit of that even even when I was playing quite well. So when I started to struggle it was um yeah, well it wasn't great. I was struggling to even walk to the first tee without feeling like my heart was going to explode out of my chest terrified of even attempting to try and get that little white ball to go somewhere near out where I wanted it to go. I kept arriving at events, petrified of being there. It was at the, the Ladies European Open in Germany where things really came to a head. It was a new venue that we hadn't played before. And um, Laura's caddy was actually caddying for me that week, Tanya, um, just as a favor, because Laura wasn't playing, I don't think. And. Um, it was the most horrible feeling because as soon as we arrived at the venue and I picked up my yardage book and I m sort of looked at a few of the holes from the clubhouse, it was like that dread of, oh no, like this is exactly the, the sort of course that's gonna trigger the, the sort of yips that I had at the time off, off the tee because if I went back there now, I'd probably look at it and think, I, I don't even know what I was worried about, but with the way I was looking at it at the time, it was like every hole was an opportunity to lose a ball or hit it in the trees or, and I just kept thinking, you know, how, I think sometimes, you know, it started off as how am I going to break 80 around here? How am I going to break 90? How am I going to break 100? It would kind of keep going up and up and up. It was almost like I was kind of faking my way through practice and I actually played okay in the practice rounds. Um, and on the range, I was hitting it re reasonably good, um, but it was always with this thing in the back of my mind that I knew it was gonna be com completely different um, as soon as the tournament came around. So you get caught in that space of trying to ignore it and hope it goes away, um, but knowing deep down that, that it's not going anywhere. Yeah, so, so pretty much before the, the sort of horrendous feeling or the problem I was having was it was it was a choice between the trees on the left and the trees on the right. It was like my body didn't know a way to, to not be in either one of those. Um, and like my heart rate would go up. I, even as I was walking to the tea, I'd start to feel almost like I was having a panic attack. And um, it's like having a haze that comes over you so you can't think straight. And, and obviously in golf, you, you're trying to be as specific as you can about targets. But all I could see was all of the places that I didn't want to go. And it felt like it was literally a physical impossibility to hit the shot where I actually wanted to hit it. Um, and my body was just 
they're really not in sync with my mind. I think like they were almost like two separate entities. Body was so stiff. I was so anxious. My brain wasn't working properly. So it, it was almost like, I felt like I was standing up there again, pretty much like I'd never hit a shot before. I literally had, had no idea what to do really. There's no doubt I had completely and utterly given up on myself as a professional golfer. The fight was draining out of me with every minute that passed. After that round, um, because I think, obviously, I was really struggling, but the thing that was sort of worse is obviously, in your mind, you, you build it up to the fact that everyone's watching you, everyone is, you know, going to be sort of laughing at you. Or, and, and none of that's true, because at, at tournaments, everyone's worried about themselves. I know myself. I don't go scrolling down the leaderboard looking for whoever's in last position or picking people out and pointing at their scores and you know, smirking or anything like that. It just doesn't happen because everyone's obviously wrapped up in, in their own game. Um, but I'd built it up that, you know, if, if I had a bad day, that it was going to be horrendous and embarrassing and, you know, sort of, are you going to be able to sort of show your face again on tour or or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I think I thought that was it. I took a prolonged break away from tournament golf and started to accept the fact I had a severe case of burnout and the yips on top of that. I had hit rock bottom with no car, no money and nowhere to live. My golf was going pretty poorly. You know, I hadn't made a cut for months. I was really struggling and I needed to make some money. I didn't have a sort of steady income. I didn't know where the next lot of money was gonna come from because I wasn't earning any money playing golf because I was playing so badly. One of the days I, I literally just stumbled across the, um, the Amazon Flex program, which was, it sounded good because you just could pick pick the hours that you worked, obviously, um, accept or decline certain blocks of time for delivering parcels. Um, so signed up for it. It, it was definitely an eye-opener, you know, when you've been lucky enough to sort of travel and, and play a sport for a living, which you take for granted as something that, that you enjoy. I don't think sometimes we realise how difficult it is to start with to actually find a job that you enjoy. It, it totally changed my outlook, I think, on on a lot of things and I think um, the f when I was thinking about the prospect of, of coming back you know I really when I had a, a little bit of hope to kind of cling on to I was willing to kind of look whatever it takes you know um, I'm willing to do because I want to give it a try because I know how much I love it um, the majority of the time and obviously when it's going well it's one of the best jobs in the world, so I think it, it made me willing to explore every avenue and really sort of be honest with myself about how I how I'd been when I was playing previously, um, to to try and have some chance to to get back to where I was. What helped me turn the corner and start to see the tiny glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel were the phenomenal human beings I'd been lucky enough to meet during my life. Oh, hello, you came back. You are. <laughs> <laughs> you, you good? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Come on in. Nice <laughs> tricks. Yeah, good, you? Yeah, all right. All right, Don't I'm worry, Thailand. I'm, I'm not moving back in, by the way. Well, that's good. <laughs> I want this to be the best cup of tea you've ever made me. With seven sugars is normal, yeah. <laughs> Do it like my grandmother did, put some whiskey in it. Go on then. So go on then, what's your, what's your memories from when I was first here? It's a bit different now, isn't it? When I first moved in, when you first took me in off the streets. I, I remember, I vividly remember the call. You were sad, disillusioned, um, lonely, I guess, looking for answers. 
distraught on the phone and I said, I've got an idea, um, leave it with me. And I spoke to Andrea. But straight away we said, yeah, you know, we've got a spare room, come along. We thought it was going to be for a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> three, Two and a half years yeah, later. Three years later. <laughs> Like, I remember the first year, it was pretty, you know, I was really struggling, like, mm. I was doing all the other jobs, like, I just didn't know how I was, it didn't feel like there was a route sort of back, you know, it just seemed impossible that I would play tournament golf again. I, I remember you, well, we, you and I went out and played together at um, Toot Hill. Oh my god, um, yeah, I remember that day. And it was a, it was a pretty... It was a bad grim day. day. Yeah, it was a pretty grim day. Yeah. You couldn't have hit a you couldn't have hit a barn door with a banjo, could you, from five yards that day? I remember I asked you to video my swing on one hole and I looked yeah. at it and I just was like, oh Time to take up darts. Yeah. You know, you had a a sort of two year almost hiatus period where it was it was really tough. Yeah. I know you played in some events and, and didn't do what you wanted to do and you know, we talked about I'm gonna give up and I remember you went and worked in a in a golf place and I was like this, this is the reality of yeah. minimum wage and stacking shelves and doing deliveries and it's just not it's not where you where you want to be I mean you should be top 25 in the world the big the big change for me was the time you rang me up when you were in I think it was Saudi in, in Jeddah and you talked about doing the blog yeah, no Should I write yeah, something? Yeah. And, I'd, and I'd said to you for a long time, just put it down in black and white. It'd be really cathartic whether you put it out anywhere or not. Mm. It's entirely up to you, but just the actual release, the, the, the writing of it is going to make you feel so much better about yourself. And that to me was the big changing point because everything just went on a massive upward curve. So I'd, I'd just come back from um, the tournament in, in Saudi, which is one of our last events of the season. Um, and I was in a sort of slightly odd position in that event. Basically, I had to earn a certain level of result to try and keep my tour card, otherwise I was going to have to go back to tour school. And I thought, again, same thing. I thought, I wonder if that's going to trigger some sort of bad response. I wonder if I'll get really anxious at the event. And it was the total opposite. It was like it, it gave me a freedom because I'd accepted I think that if if this is your last tournament you better enjoy it um, and I, I like the course anyway but I was able to play with a level of freedom that week again that I hadn't had previously especially in a in a regular tour event I'd managed to do it in a few of the rose ones but that was the first one where I kind of felt comfortable um, back at a tour event and I, I hadn't thought about doing it and I literally, I got home, I had a bit of jet lag and I was lying in bed and I opened up a, a Word document and sat there for about half an hour and just wrote nothing. And then all of a sudden it just, I don't know, it all came out and um, it was a much, much longer than, than what I ended up posting. Um, but I think that if it had been that, 100 page essay I'd written, I'd put that, no one probably would have read it. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was probably just my time where I thought, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable enough now to actually be able to have a conversation with someone about it without sort of collapsing into a heap, I guess. You were so low that day at Toot Hill and when you came here that first couple of weeks and then to see where you are now, it's just like night and day. It's it's remarkable um, change and I think and we've discussed this at length many many times to have the story that you have and to stick it out there um, in the the ether of the internet where anybody can make comments and and some people did it was a brave decision that, that's been as I say the whole process I think has been magnificent I was a mix of it, it was a kind of relief to do it and just be able to sort of be be open and, and honest with everyone because obviously my friends would have known what had been happening but uh, you know as to anybody else who might have been wondering you know she was quite good and then she's gone away and these shooting these scores or whatever they probably would have been wondering what on earth had sort of happened um, so it was nice to kind of 
get that out there and tell the story. And then there was obviously another part of me as well that was sort of terrified of, of what the reaction might be. How did you find the reaction was off the back of it? It, it totally blew me away. Um, I had, I think within the first couple of days, must have been, I think I counted, it was like 45 pros that contacted me and privately just sent me a message through my website and said, I've had, you know, same thing happened to me. I had no idea what it was. And of, of those 45, all 45 of them had quit, which just blew me away. My priorities now were far removed from those I had when I was younger. Instead of thinking hitting endless balls is the only way to feel worthy of success, I now spend the bulk of my time looking after my mind to keep it healthy. It took me a long time to realise it can be the strongest part of my game and my life. Do you know, I think I'm a lot easier on myself. I used to be way too hard on myself. And, and obviously that takes away from the enjoyment. You've, you've got to get the balance right, I think, because it's a sport. Um, and obviously when I first started, before I was professional, it was enjo pure enjoyment. It wasn't for your, for your career or your living. And when you, when you turn pro, it's quite easy to get too hard on yourself and really take the enjoyment away from it. So it feels too much like hard work. There needs to be that balance between, obviously, you know you're a professional and you have to treat things in that way. But at the same time, when you're out there, you actually have to be enjoying it. Otherwise, it's, it's horrendously difficult because every day can, can be miserable if you get into that spiral of kind of just being way too hard on yourself. And I think that, that's probably part of where my problem started. I was far too hard on myself. You know, my opinion of myself as a golfer was a bit too low. Um, and it was probably from, you know, worrying too much maybe about what other people wanted me to do or the expectations that they had. Um, and it's very easy for it all just to get, get, get bogged down a little bit in your mind. So uh, now when I'm out there, I've had, I've played pretty well. I've had chances to win, but no matter what's happened, it's like at the start of every day, I'm just willing to accept what will be will be and actually enjoy it being out there. Whereas before I think I could be out playing and just not really having as much fun as I should have been, even though you've got to get that balance right between sort of career and enjoyment as well. This for a round of level par 70. Yeah. Oh, and in it goes for the Welsh woman. She's really been struggling the last few years, but drawing on all of her experience from those two Solheim Cup appearances. And that's a really nice round of 70. She looks relieved. Do you know, the, the week of that event was really odd because I actually hadn't been playing very well and I played a practice round um, at Brockenhurst the day before with, with a couple of my tour colleagues and I played terrible. Um, so my expectation was zero and, and that course is exactly the sort of course again that would have triggered the, the really kind of deep anxiety that I was feeling because there's quite a few tight shots around that golf course. And on the first tee, I, I did have this big wave of adrenaline, um, but it was one of the few times where I'd had that kind of surge and I felt like the, the tightness in, in my chest, but still managed to hit an okay shot. And I think the fact that I played so badly the day before and, and taken any expectation for myself actually kind of helped. Um, and before I knew it, I'd got to the end of the day and I had this putt on the last green, which I probably knew was to either win or possibly be in a playoff. And I hold it and it, it was all a bit surreal. It was slightly like, a, like an out-of-body experience. I didn't quite feel like I was within myself. Um, so yeah, and then, then I had to wait for quite a number of hours before everyone had finished to, to go into a playoff. But the one thing I think that I was still worried about was if I actually do play well somewhere, what am I going to be like at the other end of the scale? So when I was really at, at the bottom, it was horrendous, you know, and, and trying to make a cut felt like the most pressure I could ever feel. But then I wondered if I, by some miracle, do ever manage to get back and have a chance to win again, 
is it gonna come back? Is that gonna trigger the, the same response? And it was it was actually the total opposite. Brewerton also going in from a lovely angle. Just out of the first cut, so this might not spin as much. Oh, she's judged that release very nicely. I was completely calm. Um, I think the fact that I was in that position and that she played pretty well, it was almost like it was just a, a, a release of, of all the pressure that had kind of been weighing me down for so long. And um, at that point, if, if you've obviously got into a playoff, you're playing to some sort of reasonably good standard. I think that you've got an element of control over your game. Um, and, and in the playoff, I just w was able to be free, hit the shots as I wanted. And, and thank goodness, you know, it, it was that, that fear kind of left me of, is, is it going to come back if, if I'm in that situation? to L.E.T. Q School, uh, obviously an opportunity to get back to the pinnacle of the sport and get back onto the main tour. What were your feelings going into that? Um, that, that really was last chance, Saloon, the Q School. Again, I felt like I'd accepted, okay, you know, this, this could be the end, this could be the last time I play. And, and I was actually okay with it. it. It was the strangest week ever because the first two days were were like encapsulated everything that had gone wrong for the years before. So for the first two days, I felt horrific. Um, I was hitting all these shots that I had been hitting in the previous years. And I felt, so, I, it was so anxious. My, my chest was so tight the whole week. I felt almost hardly able to put one foot in front of the other. So I think at one point after a few holes in the first round, one of my friends said I was actually dead last on the leaderboard, which which I wouldn't have seen at the time because I'd have been out on the course. And after two rounds, I was out of it. And I got home after the the second round and I spoke to um, Alan on the phone, who's a performance guy that I'd been working with, who'd been the one who actually managed to get me to kind of really change my thought process at a deep deeper level. And it was like a, a, fli a switch just flicked and I, felt like I just let go of of everything and I've never in in my career had such a drastic change in performance level between one day and the next day so the first two days probably some of the worst golf I've played in in a long time and the last three days was probably three of the best days that I'd ever had it was a bit surreal I because obviously only a couple of days before I've been thinking, what am I going to do you know, now for, for the rest of my life? This, this is like a second chance. It's literally like starting again, um, a, new, a new career. So my level of appreciation for it has obviously just gone through the roof because it, it feels like someone has, has kind of gifted me a, a, an opportunity to start again. I'm, I'm quite proud, I'm, I'm thankful more than anything to to all the people that sort of dragged me through it when I'd I, I mean I'd given up on on myself and, and they didn't <laughs> when you're trapped inside your own mind surrounded by voices that don't belong to you it's hard to have any kind of objective perspective Luckily for me, I have some astonishing people in my life who saved me from myself and from those voices. I'm just going to pass you my iPad over to you, just to let you watch something. Me? Yeah, see what you make of it. Oh God. It's not going to make me cry, is it? <laughs> oh God. I wanted to say how fantastic it is to see you playing so well again. Uh, it doesn't come as a surprise, you know, I think you're one of the best players that's ever played this game. But you were in a pretty desperate position, let's be honest, and to make the comeback that you have is truly a testament to your personality and perseverance and character. And 
when you inevitably win that next event, and you will, South Africa showed that, that you definitely will, um, not only will it be the most popular win on the LET, uh, but it will be something that uh, you have deserved so much. And I hope I'm at that event. I think you're waiting for your 40th birthday. <laughs> Whichever event is just before that, I think that's the one that you'll crack it with. But you never know, it could be the Women's Open or something special like that. Whatever one it is, I hope I'm there for a, a celebratory glass, glass of champers. Good luck and I'll see you soon. Bro, I am uh, actually going to struggle to put into words how just incredible um, I think it is what you've done. Um, it's really not that long ago that you were um, in a pretty bad, pretty bad way. Um, no offence. Um, but I think it's very easy for people to sort of think, oh, she's lost her way and she's worked hard and she's back. But I think only you will really know how tough and dark those times were for you. So um, to see you back uh, now contending is just really is like inspirational. I know that's a word people throw around a lot, but it truly is. Um, I never saw the old brew, I know I told you this, but the new brew we've seen this year is pretty mega. Um, and throughout it all, you've just been an amazing friend and a great human, um, which says it all, really. You've helped me in my struggles, um, which I can't thank you enough for. Um, yeah. Success is not the absence of failure, it's the refusal to surrender. And you never surrendered, even when everyone else would have. So thanks to you now, I won't ever surrender either. Thanks, Brie, and I can't wait to see you lifting a trophy soon, and we'll be there with the bottles. Oh, yes, yeah, so Becky Brewton, um, a true inspiration of mine, um, looking up to her as a, a young Welsh aspiring professional golfer, um, and seeing Becky, you know, take the Ladies European Tour by storm um, in her first few years on, on the Ladies European Tour. Um, she's truly inspiring, and obviously has gone through the ups and downs of um, professional golf and over the last few years has been a struggle and more downs probably. Um, but to see her come through now on the other side, um, just world class. Uh, always knew she would get back to where she belongs. And um, I just look forward to watching her lift many more trophies in the next few years. And um, yeah, she to me is the definition of resilience. And I'm, I'm super happy to Call her one of my close friends and um, new business partner. So I hope uh, we can have a lot of success together in the in the future years. Hey, Blue. Oh God! First, I just want to say how this one's going to be good. Um, we've all seen the struggles that you've had, and to be back to where you belong is is absolutely outstanding. Um, if I can be half the player in person that you are, I'd be absolutely over the moon. I'm so proud to be able to call you my friend. Um, you know what they say, class is permanent. Keep being you, Brew, and uh, we all love you. Hey, Brew, just wanted to say that we're all so proud of you, everything you've been through, and, um, you know, coming back to where you belong. Yeah, there's no one on tour that I am happier to see back where they're supposed to be playing good golf. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be proud of you, bro. Oh my I'm god. I'm right from Southern Hills. Anyway, <laughs> I was asked to say something about Brew, um, about where she's been and where she is now. Well, I never doubted it personally. Things weren't good for a while, um, but she showed the true character. We know she's got character, never gave up. A lot of people probably thought she might never get back to this. Um, Personally, I had a few wobbles myself, but uh, you always got to realise that uh, Brew doesn't give up. Um, she was always a great golfer on the range. Now she's taken it to the course. Uh, unlucky not to win a few weeks ago, but that's not even a setback. That's just learning how to win again. And I've absolutely no doubt that um, Brew, you'll win again soon. And uh, no one deserves it more than you because you really have worked very hard. What I mean. Awesome. I just wanted to say that I can be prouder of what you're achieving every single day and to see where you are now and how normal it feels for you given the places that I know you've been in. It's truly incredible and sometimes I think you forget just how amazing it is. I've seen some of the, the dark places that you've been and to be here now, I don't think you realise just how many people you've inspired with what you've done and I'm excited to see where it goes from here. There's no stopping you now. <gasps> That's awesome. How did you get all that? Oh my God. 
You must have paid all them a lot to say that nice stuff about me. <laughs> oh my God, that's so cool. Thank you for doing that. What advice would you give to others who find themselves in a very similar position to yourself? It, it's so hard to treat yourself the way you would treat someone else. So I think try, trying to look at it more in that way and actually just being honest about about how you really feel. Um, because obviously I internalised a, lo a lot of my conversations with myself, which was definitely what, what made it worse. Um, so yeah, just, you know, if you're lucky enough to have people in your life that you trust, then just, just tell them and, and go from there. I'm now in my 19th year on tour and it has taken that long to finally feel like the real me is playing on tour. It's the first time the real me has ever been outside the confines of a room in my mind. It's the first time I feel like I'm playing the golf that belongs to me, that I feel comfortable with. <laughs>